So um, one of the things that I like to do with couples is um, ask each other on a scale of one to 10, how well do I communicate? And what would make it a 10? All right, what's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Best You Podcast. Today, I am super fired up to be joined by the one and only Catherine Gordon. Catherine, just want to start off by saying thanks so much for spending the time with me today. Thank you so much for having me, Nick. <laughs> of course. Well, right before we hopped on, Catherine was telling me about how, yes, she had a busy day, but she found a way to prioritize her health and her fitness and get her workout in. So those of you guys uh, who know me know that I'm all about that. So kudos to you for finding a way to getting it in uh, amidst the the chaos and the busyness of your schedule. Um, but the way I kind of want to d- start today, Catherine, and we'll get into relationships here pretty soon, but I want to kind of get back and do a little bit of your history because I knew that you grew up with some alcoholism in your family. And so there's a little bit of challenge there in your childhood because of that. And I know that you talk about how in your teenage teenage years and your younger years, the, you partied a decent amount, but then you get to this point where you're 25 and you essentially changed your life and made a complete 180, it sounds like, from the perspective of how you treated your body, health, and fitness and such. And obviously, a lot of people on this podcast or listening to this podcast are maybe not looking looking to make as dramatic of changes. Maybe they're not in as in a spot like you were in, but they're definitely looking to make changes. So I'm interested to hear about what was kind of the impetus that led you to 25, I'm putting my foot down, I'm making this change. Ooh, you want to go there already? (laughs) Well, you know, um, I just did a whole podcast on this. I don't know if you heard it, but I mean, I, um, I, I did drugs. I was doing recreational drugs from an early age. I was 13. I started smoking pot, um, started snorting cocaine at 16 and moved in with my boyfriend who was dealing it. Um, knew that I really had to get away from him and out of that life, moved to Nashville, Tennessee and lived off old Hickory Boulevard and started working for a company selling communication systems. But you know, no matter where you go, there you are. So I kind of found the same people, um, doing the same things and fell right back into old patterns and then discovered this drug called ecstasy and really had just hit this place of like, I can't do this anymore. Went to rehab, got out and I stayed clean and sober for about a year, but I was dating this professional wrestler. And so he was down in Atlanta. And so I ended up moving down to Atlanta And then instead of getting a professional job, um, you know, I had always waited tables or bartended. So I knew how to make quick cash. So I started waiting tables at this uh, restaurant bar in in Atlanta called um, American Pie. And of course, it wasn't too long after that. I started drinking again, doing Coke and ecstasy. And just through a series of events, you know, finding myself at, a hotel on the south side of Atlanta without my car, no purse, and having to get up in the morning and go to work. And I really, I got home that morning and hit my knees and just said, God, help me. Like, I need help. And I um, really, from that moment on, for the next 12 years, I, I embarked on a whole health and wellness and fitness um overhaul. Now I will say, even as a 16, 17 year old, uh, woman, young woman, I was into fitness. Like I always had a gym membership and I was always going to, to the gym. And I feel grateful for that. Cause I, that was something I could, I could, you know, get back into that. It was familiar with me. And, um, yeah, so that's, that's kind of the beginning of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> There's more, I don't know how, how, deep you want to go. So. Yeah, no, I, that's awesome. And first off, I appreciate you sharing all of that. I know that like, that's right, right on the bat, right off the bat, we're going in there. <laughs> so I, I appreciate you sharing all that. I know everybody will be able to honestly feel, I feel like a lot of relief because 
I didn't know necessarily to the extent of that story. You know, I just see you as you are now and don't know all the stuff that's gone on in the past. And I think oftentimes if maybe as a parent, if they see their child at a young age start to do some of these things, they start to think that their life, like, oh my gosh, they're going to be a horrible human being long term. But like, there's there's time to change and there's things that you can do um, to potentially help them change over time as well. And obviously- that's what I always say is your past doesn't define you. I mean, you know, let it refine you. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, there's hope. And, you know, also when you're young, you know, and especially I have kids now that are starting to be the age that I was when I was doing all this and, you know, there's always ups and downs. The hope is, is that, you know, they never turn too far in either direction, but yeah, I mean, there's always hope and, um, I didn't have a strong foundation. I feel like that's so important and something I tried to provide to my children. You know, they say like, if you nurture the root, you get the fruit. And Mm. so even through, um, you know, the, the hard times that we had when I was raising my kids, there are some things that I did, um, that I feel, were instrumental in, in helping them feel grounded later on. And listen, my kids have gone through some stuff too, but, you know, have bounced back, especially my son when he was in college. And, um, well, there's something we did. I can share it with you. If you have any uh, parents that listen to your podcast. Of course. Oh yeah, please, please. So, um, one of the things I highly recommend, and the only thing I regret about this is not doing it soon enough. And that is having family meetings. And so every Sunday, if we could do it now, the kids, when they started playing a lot of elite sports, we might have practices or games, but it was always one day a week, ideally Sunday, we would sit at the table together. Um, Now, listen, this is the other thing I want to say, fight for it because it's not always going to be easy. Like there, you know, we'd be a family meeting and the kids would groan and guess what? Sometimes I'd be the one groaning, like I didn't want to stop what I was doing, but I'm telling you, I really believe those family meetings is what provided such a strong foundation for our children and for us as a family to this day that we have that connection. And so John would rather read some kind of scripture or he would read, um, you know, something motivational or something he had seen. And then we'd rather talk about that sometimes. We wouldn't end up talking about that. Sometimes we'd end up finding out something that was going on with one of our children, you know, so it was just a time for us to connect as a family. And honestly, always in the end, it was, we always felt like um, we, we, they were laughing, you know, there was a connection. We always felt like this had been a great thing to do, but wasn't always easy to get them to do in the beginning. So mm-hmm. that's something I recommend. You know, I'm not going to say it's going to foolproof you from ever having any um, issues with your kids, but I feel like if you can always keep that communication and connection open, even through those, you know, valleys that your kids might go in including your spouse, you know, of course, you know, I wrote a book called relationship grit and it's all about relationships and oh my gosh, the four, the number one thing in my four C's is communication. Mm -hmm. Um, that if you don't have that, it's going to be hard to have anything else. So, yeah, no doubt. Well, I'll probably jump into the communication and one of the specific questions I had around that here in a second, but I love how you talked about the family meetings because I've had the fortunate busting an opportunity to interview now both your husband, John, and your daughter, Jade, uh, which has been super cool. And I, I can't remember the exact way that I asked the question, but I know towards the end of my interview with Jade, I asked her about one thing that y'all did as parents that really helped shape the person that she is today. And she talked about the family meetings. She and so, did. yeah. And I so, love that. Yeah. Obviously it made a profound impact, even if, you know, I, th- I know that for me growing up as well, there were times when parents would have me do things and you moan and groan in the moment, but then you're appreciative of it later on. And so I think it's permission for people to do things, even though the other person is moaning and groaning in the moment, like they're going to be appreciative of it later on. So that's key. And for us, it was family dinners. I think, like you said, it's just more than anything, having the space for open communication and connection. Same thing. That's it's that I mean, family dinners are great too. Yeah. Just, you know, it's about having that time together. Yeah. No doubt. 
no doubt. And relationship grit is an absolute gem. I'm about three quarters of the way done with it now, um, but super quick, easy read up to this point, and it's been super entertaining. I love the back and forth between you and John. And one of the things that I pointed out or wanted to ask you was about the communication and specifically about expectations, because you guys talked about how your personalities are different. He's more type A, the organized type, and the type who cleans his dishes right away. You're a little bit less so, might leave your dishes in there uh, in the sink for a little while. And so he might have this expectation and place this expectation on you of like, she should clean the dishes right away and name whatever example you want to. And I always think it's important to, and these aren't necessarily opposite things, but to both communicate your expectations with the other person, but also to not place unrealistic expectations on the other person. And so I want you to first maybe talk about the importance of not placing unrealistic expectations on the other person. And then we'll talk about how to properly communicate the expectations that you do have. Okay. I love that. And so (laughs) I can relate that to, you know, in a relationship, you're not always going to do everything that you want to do. Um, At some point, you guys need to come together and say, um, you know, John, I need this place cleaned up. I can't see it. Like he can't stand in me. I'm not talking like I'm not a messy person at all. But if you listen to John Gordon, oh my gosh, you know, but, but I, but I had to realize for his mental state, if that's important to him, so we had to have some kind, we had to come to an agreement. And that's where I think in relationships, you know, you do need to, to make small investments in the relationship, do small sacrifices. They do matter, right? So John Gottman, the Gottman Institute um, on relationships say couples that make small sacrifices for each other are 85% more likely to stay together. And so, you know, it also kind of goes to the fact that you you have to remember you're on the same team. And I, I know what it's like to be super, super stressed out. Um, you know, especially when I was raising my kids, I felt like I was doing a lot of it by myself. John was off traveling all the time and it's so easy to start, um, keeping score, right? But if you keep score, you both lose, And so it was a matter of us coming together as a team and, you know, him expressing things like, hey, listen, it didn't matter as much for us before COVID because John traveled all the time. And then during COVID, John was home all the time. And that was tough. That was a really hard one for me because, you know, I just wasn't used to him being in the house all the time and him wanting things a certain way. But I mean, if you love somebody and you want to have a good relationship, you you need to come to a meeting of, of the minds and, and decide that you're going to give uh, enough to them to make them happy as well. And so that's about loving and sacrificing for each other. We'll be back to the interview in just a second, but first I wanted to share some words from a participant of the 10 week transformation. At Best You, we started running the 10WT back in January of 2020 and have since had 313 people and counting go through it. They've seen their bodies get stronger than ever before. They've seen the stubborn fat finally come off and they've seen their habits dramatically improve. And honestly, more than anything, they've seen their self-confidence skyrocket. If you want to learn more about the 10-week transformation, then you can go to nickcarrier.com slash 10WT. That's nickcarrier.com slash the number 10WT. We'll get back to the show in just a second, but first, here's what they had to say. The 10-week transformation has changed a lot of facets of my life. I had multiple surgeries. I had broken my right foot. I had surgery on my left foot. I had my rotator cuff rebuilt. I gained about 35 pounds. I was completely depressed. I don't even think I knew I was depressed. As I was going through physical therapy, I was going to Orange Theory Fitness, which is great. And I was getting basically fit, but the needle wasn't moving a lot. And I was frustrated and I didn't know what was going on. I don't even know how I heard about the transformation with Nick, 
But I signed up for it because I thought oh, something needed to change. And I had no idea how much was going to change. The physical fitness part of it is amazing. Getting to see where you start to where you finish at the end of 10 weeks is really cool because you don't realize how much you're growing in that time. But more than that, it has changed my mindset about how I think about food, alcohol, um, how I approach things. It's just been an overall really positive change in my entire life. How I think about relationship, career, all of it. It's something you can't explain. You have to experience it <laughs> to understand it. I don't want to sound cheesy, but it's amazing. Mm, that's really good. I think the, like you said, I love the statistic. I think you said 85% more likely to stay together if they're, if you're willing to make small sacrifices for each other. And it's funny, I was not thinking about asking this or this wasn't even in the frame of mind when I was preparing for this interview, but I had the opportunity to officiate my cousin's wedding back in a few months ago now. And in preparation for that, I was thinking about what what is love? Like what practically does love look like? And I have a whole lot less experience with that, being somebody who is not married or anything like that. Obviously, I love my family, so there's that version of love. But I essentially identified three things that I thought love was, and I thought love was having fun together, willingness to sacrifice for each other, and better together. Again, fun to get fun, willingness to sacrifice, and better together. And so I'm kind of interested to hear what you feel like love looks like. You know, you talked about sacrifice there, but I'm interested in hearing your version of that, maybe. I agree with exactly what you just said. Mm. I mean, it is about being together, um, having fun together being intimate together, but also there's a level of sacrifice that you have to do to be in a partnership. You know, there has to be emotional maturity. I mean, you know, the other part of that is although I did my best relationship work when I wasn't in a relationship, the truth is you work out a lot of your issues when you are in relationship. You know, and so it's about holding that space for each other. Yeah. I mean, and you're not really oh, okay. asking this, but I, what I think about when I also just think about relationships in, in general is it's about wanting, you know, well, I don't know if I should say this. It's I, I'm right. I'm writing another book, Nick. It's on sex and intimacy and it's okay. not, it's not inappropriate. It's, it's absolutely about oneness and, and in the union, it's not, a physical sex book, but in that, you know, it's about being with one person and wanting, wanting to be intimate a thousand times, as opposed to being with a thousand people once. Right. So, mm -hmm. you know, how do you do that? How do you, you, you come together as a union? So it does take that sacrifice and, um, communication, right? communication, com communicating what you need, communicating what you want. So um, one of the things that I like to do with couples is um, ask each other on a scale of one to 10, how well do I communicate and what would make it a 10? Because everybody communicates differently too. Right. right. They do. Like John, he's very much an introvert even though he's the one out speaking on these huge stages, believe it or not, he, he isn't one for small talk. Um, you know, when he's home, he really doesn't want to go out and go to parties and, and go out socializing. And I do. And so what I found for us, so when he would come home after doing these speaking engagements and I really needed to communicate with him, I had to figure out what is a way how can I get him in a place to want to talk? And so for him, it's walking. So of course you can't do this when your kids are little, but as your kids get older, just taking a walk after dinner. And I know we're totally mm -hmm. going on a different tangent, but I just felt like it kind of worked in that and that ways to ways to communicate, which is helps you bond, right? It helps you build that trust and connection with each other. And so we would just walk. And a lot of times on these walks, we would 
fight, you know, we, but it ended up being a great way for us to connect and made us feel more in love. Right. Yeah. No, I love that. I think, I think what you did was really critical trying to brainstorm what's going to open up his communication, because I feel like a lot of probably more wives and husbands deal with that in the sense that their husbands aren't maybe great communicators or not open to communication as frequently. And one of the things that he had already done a lot was go on walks. So get them in an environment that they enjoy or is familiar with them. And that might open them up a little bit more. So I think that's great. One of the things that I'm, I'm super intrigued about, and I'm also in the age where a lot of people around me are getting married. A lot of my friends are getting married. A lot of my peers are getting married. And one of the things that shocked me that I had not known previously when reading your book was that y'all got engaged about six months after having started dating. And, you know, when we're observing different couples getting engaged and such, when something like that happens that quickly, I'm like, holy crap. So I'm interested in your thoughts behind between like starting to date and then getting engaged or and or before getting married, what are the different things that people need to learn about each other or the different conversations that people need to have to ensure they might not be rushing into it? Because I don't think there is a an appropriate timeline. I just think there might be an appropriate level of communication that has been experienced between the two. Okay, that's such a good question. And you're right. I don't think there's a timeline because obviously John and I were engaged. We moved in together, which I'm not recommending. I know now that's like, I wouldn't want my kids to do that. But at the time, that's what we did. Um, we moved in together after two months. We got engaged after six months. We literally bought a house nine months in, moved into that house, and then were married a year and three months in. So by the time we were engaged, married, new house, all within a year and three months. Um, and listen, that's probably why if you read my book, there is so much turmoil and there is so much fighting and there's a lot that happened. Um, so I'm not recommending that, but Hey, for us, it's been 26 years, so it worked. So there's some really basic things that I think are important. And I actually have some of them in the back of my book and my tips. So you'll read those mm -hmm. and make sure that you have the same shared vision. You know, where do you see yourselves in the future? You know, and it doesn't have to be like, you know, Nick, you love, you see yourself retired on a mountain and, you know, your wife sees herself at the beach. I mean, yes, it's important to kind of have an idea that you want to do some of those same things because you're going to be traveling together as a couple, right? But I mean, you know, like really important things. Where do you see yourselves? You know, how do you view money? How do you view money? Is that, you know, do you do you expect your wife to work? You don't. I mean, these are all, you know, um, things I think that are worth discussing, you know, before you get married. I think it'd be really good. I, I think I recommend, you know, that, well, of course, I recommend that all couples before they get married, read my book. I'm not just saying that because yeah. a lot of it's in there. But, you know, um, John and I, we ended up having to have some therapy before we got married. We we, we were hitting some bumps. And, um, of course, if you read my book, you'll hear because I can go zero to 60. <laughs> you know, I grew up with two brothers and um, there was a lot of fist fighting. So when John would make me mad, I would like go flying across the room at him. And, you know, that's just not smart. <laughs> that's not smart. So we, we were like, you know, we, we need to nip this in the bud, poor guy. And I mean, of course he wouldn't fight back. Right. So, yeah. um, yeah. So, you know, it's about, you know, figuring out what you want in life together. I mean, you know, I know this sounds obvious, but you'd be surprised. Sometimes I hear of couples that get together and then all of a sudden they're, they're, they're in, in it and they've committed to each other all this time. Now they're looking into getting married and then they find out, well, you know, one of them really didn't want to have kids. That's, that's a big deal. Right. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So it's about talking through those things. And I know that can be hard, right. Especially when maybe, you know, you haven't engaged, you know, you haven't proposed to them or, but those are conversations that need to be, need to be had. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Well, I kind of want to go to the zero to 60 comment. I, I, I love that. You know, you had, uh, 
the story is essentially one time, Catherine, you were in therapy and you kind of jumped on a question really quickly and the therapist said, wow, you go to zero to 60 just like that. And it's been a continual joke for you guys uh, moving forward from then. And I'm always interested in just the ability to not react too quickly and to try to take some time and respond. Ever since I read the book Man's Search for Meaning years ago, talking about the gap between stimulus and response that's always been in the back of my mind because I used to be a little bit more quick-tempered as well myself, and I've continued to try to work on that. So what are some things that you've done to try to (laughs) make it so that you maybe don't go zero to 60 as quickly and you have a little bit more gap between stimulus and response, if you will? You know, I've definitely mellowed over the years, <laughs> but you know, I, I think it's a level of emotional maturity. And I think the more that I was able to trust John, like trust that he genuinely and ultimately wanted the best for me in our relationship, I wasn't so quick to flip out or jump on him. So, you know, I, I think it was that, you know, because early on, you know, I, I had watched, I didn't come from a, um, family that had a healthy, uh, you know, my parents didn't have a healthy relationship and, you know, so I really didn't know how to be in relationship in a mature way. So I learned a lot in our relationship over the years. Yeah. Yeah. And it was through that trust that I didn't beat John up. No. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) No, I mean, trust, trust is one of the quickest movers to action. That's for sure. And and whatever that means for the individual. So that's awesome. I I appreciate you sharing that. And before I ask the last question, Catherine, I just want to acknowledge you for a couple of things. One, for making the change yourself back when you were 25 and kind of going through it with some of the substances that you were doing and making that huge transition so that you could be the role model for your family and for other people that you are today for taking it upon yourself to make that transition and for all the relationship you guys have done, like in the vulnerable vulnerability in the book and the vulnerability that you shared at the beginning of the podcast is just so powerful and it allows a lot of people to relate to you and know that there is hope know that they can work through challenging situations as well. So I want to acknowledge you for the personal changes that changes that you've made, the changes that you've made with the relationship and your ability to communicate that with so many as well. Oh, thank you, Nick. Yep. This is what I always say. I mean, it's never too late to change. As I said, in the beginning of the podcast, your past doesn't define you. I mean, I've been able to create a beautiful, with the help of God, let me just say that all praise to God. Um, but to help, you know, to, to be able to create a beautiful life and a beautiful family for myself. And, um, yeah, so, you know, we, we, I don't know many people that have the idyllic life, right. That, that grew up in this, like, even if it was pretty normal, they'd still tell you they had issues. So, you know, we all have stuff, right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there's hope for everybody. That is exactly what I think. And you can hear it and read it in my book is that, and especially, let me tell you, if you're struggling in your relationship, you can change it. You really can. There is hope. I'm telling you, John and I, there was some stuff it's in the book. I don't know if you've gotten there yet, but if we can get to the other side and we can celebrate 26 years of marriage, anybody can do it. Yeah. No doubt about it. No doubt about it. I appreciate you sharing that. And as we've talked about so much, y'all need to go get relationship grit right now. Whether you're in a relationship, you're you have a girlfriend, girlfriend, boyfriend, you're married, you have not in a relationship yet. There is not a bad time. There is not an appropriate time. Any time is an appropriate time to read this book. There's so many great lessons in here. Uh, grit stands, or the acronym grit is for God, resolve, invest, and together. And I know that you're going to get so much out of the book. So y'all make sure you go get relationship grit. And if you want more of Catherine and her realness and her vulnerability, then you need to go listen to her podcast, the Catherine for real podcast as well. And you need to make sure you go follow her on Instagram at Catherine Gordon. Uh, but any other way that people should go learn more about you and connect with you? No, I mean, I have a website, Catherine for real. I've got some free downloads on there. I've got a, um, 
seven little sacrifices you can make in your relationship to have a great relationship. That's a PDF I have. Um, I have a gratitude journal that I designed and it's really, it's something quick and simple. Cause I know a lot of times, especially I'm just, I'm going to kind of generalize here and say, most men don't want to do stuff like this. So it's just, a, it's four questions that you as a couple can do together in the evening that will help bring you together and help you know, acknowledge and see ways that you can support each other. Um, But yeah, check out my podcast. I've got some pretty cool stuff coming up. I'm just going to say this. If anybody listening to this has breast implants, I have a whole story about that. My breast implants almost killed me. They were filled with a black mold called Aspergillus nigus. And I did my own solo cast on that. But last night I interviewed a doctor and his patient advocate who are, they're doing amazing things. So um, wow. check that out. That'll be releasing next week. So I don't know why I felt like I needed to share that, but maybe no, somebody listening it. needs to hear it. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. Appreciate you sharing. Well, Catherine, last question here is I think that in order to get closer to the best version of yourself, it's a, both a constant journey. I don't think that we ever actually get there. And it's also a unique journey. I think the way that I'm going to get closer to the best version of myself is going to be a little bit different than the way that you get closer to the best version of yourself. So this last question is for, is for you personally, is if there are three things that you could currently do or currently work on to get closer to the best version of Catherine Gordon that you could possibly be, then what are those three things that you could currently do or currently work on? Oh, first one for me, renew my mind. Mm. Renew my mind. You know, um, I am normally a very, very positive person, but I've got to say, I found myself really starting to get on this negative track. And, you know, the brain is like an antenna and John talks all about this in his new book, but it's kind of like the more you start tuning into that negativity, the more, the more it keeps coming. And so I have really started to make an effort to change that, change those thoughts. Like seriously, and I'm talking about like out loud, all of a sudden a negative thought will come in and I'll go, stop, stop it. And I try to replace it with something positive. Mm. Um, I can't remember exactly what your question is, but hopefully this is the second part because it's something I'm doing now, which is the physical part, right? Um, I actually listened to this podcast and the guy was like, I don't care how, no, this is what he said. If you're not physically fit, you're not mentally fit. Mm. And that hit me. I was like, oh, because I feel like I'm mentally fit, right? Well, you know what? It takes a lot of mental strength to be physically fit. Mm -hmm. So that's something I've been working on. And then let me think of one more. You want one more. Tell me the question one more time. Yeah, I was saying three things to get closer to the best version of yourself. So being physically fit, renewing my mind. And, you know, the other thing I like to do is I actually, this is something I've done recently and it's, it's helped me in writing this new book is as I'll, I'll, I emailed my friends and I'm like, can you all tell me something that I have done? We can do this back and forth with each other that might've helped you. And so it was a way to kind of reinforce some of the things that, um, that might be my gifts, so to speak, that I can maybe share with the world or strengthen in my own self. And of course, you know, that went both ways. And so it was interesting. I got some, some really cool feedback from that and some things where I thought, wow, I didn't know about it. It was like one, there was one theme that kept coming in. And I thought, wow, you know, I didn't, I don't see myself like that, but it was something I thought, well, I'm going to make sure that I continue to, um, be that person. And for me, the one thing people get saying is that I, I always compliment them no matter what I would. And, you know, it's funny because I realize I think my daughter got that from me because I'll be with her and I just, she's always complimenting people. And I thought, I guess that's a great thing. So that's something that I want to continue to do so that I can also lift other people up, elevate yeah. them. That's awesome. That's, I think that last one is great to ask other or to kind of have other people identify some of the different gifts and things that you do to, to change their lives. Cause like you said, I think oftentimes we're unaware of some of those really good habits that we might have because we might just do them naturally. But then if we can amplify them and do them more so then then it'll be, 
just impact more people as well. Well, Catherine, that was great. Make sure you guys go get Relationship Grit. Make sure you go listen to Catherine for Real podcast. Make sure you go download those seven sacrifices. We talked about the importance of the willingness to sacrifice today. Download those four questions so that you have some guidance to try to open lines of communication with you and maybe your significant other. But that's all we got today, Catherine. Thanks so much. That's awesome. Thank you, Nick.